Hello. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the big picture live in person. I am Felix Fawes. Welcome to question time. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, <laughs> joining us today, we have Sarah Shepherd, who is Chair of Nottingham Labour Students. Hello. <laughs> President of the Debating Union, Owen Riley. <laughs> Editor of the Blue Press magazine, <laughs> Titus Hopkins. <laughs> and President of Nottingham University Conservative Association, Daniel Dieck. Well, thank you everyone for coming. So this is a politics show. I hope you know that. Uh, <laughs> normally we air on Saturdays from five to six. Do follow us on all our social medias, Spotify, YouTube, Instagram. That would be very helpful indeed. So the format today is we're going to accept questions from the audience and I'm going to ask some as well. There are going to be three broad themes, um, economics, domestic, foreign. In economics, you can ask anything about the upcoming budget perhaps or more larger ideological questions like is capitalism the root of all evil but Sarah will appreciate that uh, then we'll have in domestic that could be anything from how do we improve the NHS to um, will Boris Johnson make a comeback uh, foreign policy that questions such as what will happen in Ukraine what do you think will happen in Ukraine or you can ask a question about China all sorts of things and then the last part of the show will be anything else if you feel like you've got a question that doesn't neatly fit into any of those groups then that is the time to ask that. There are no, there will be no silly questions, so don't feel a, uh, any, um, don't feel any hesitation to ask. You, this is a safe environment to ask any questions you want, um, and I'll be very appreciative to have them. Uh, although caveat, we will not be accepting any questions today on trans rights or abortion, so please don't ask any questions related to that. Before we begin properly, can we have another round of applause <coughs> to Ben Miller over here for his help in organising this and to Ben. I think I have said everything that I needed to say. So I, oh, fire exit's over there, but we're not, we're not <laughs> intending there to be a fire. Um, okay, my first question, we'll start with economics, is the cost of living crisis. This is something that the public or across the political spectrum name as their number one concern what does the panel think is the answer to try and fix this problem and i'm going to start with you sarah um i think well my answer to it would be fairly obvious and uh, the first step for that is a labor government yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thanks guys <laughs> um i think the the cost of living crisis has been a result of uh, conservative rule since 2010 and I think that's completely exacerbated the crisis that we're currently in although you know there have been underlying uh, causes of it such as uh, factor right policies such as you know the right to buy scheme things like that which have um, you know impacted the number of um, uh, local authority housing being built um, but yeah conservative uh, the policies of the conservative government over the last 13 years mm. Well, I think it is, it's quite rich that she cited Thatcherite policies uh, for, for causing inf inflation when Thatcher's number one goal when she took office was to combat inflation. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 also yeah, strange that, it's also strange that um, a government which was committed to austerity, something which I'm sure she would critique, um, is being blamed for inflation when it's widely agreed that... Uh, austerity or reducing spending is something that will bring down inflation instead of uh, stoking it. So I don't think that's a, uh, an adequate explanation. I think we do need to look at the, uh, the war in Ukraine where you've seen um, a squeeze on the supply of gas, the supply of oil, on the global food supply um, as a cause for inflation. And, and we are seeing inflation beginning to abate and it's starting to come down. Um, I also think that the, um, the massive spending splurge during lockdown and the, the quantitative easing has got to bear some responsibility for the inflation we're seeing now. Mm. Oh, yeah, go, go get over Sarah, do Sorry, Sarah. Oh, oh, oh fair. Yeah, then we'll let you respond. I'd time. love to yield my time, no. <laughs> um, yeah, look, there's, there's a lot to it. I think it is the truth that there is so many factors in it. I'd love to just pin it all on the Tories. I really would. <laughs> there is different factors in there. One is a broader factor I think we have is that we 
we are overly reliant on oil and gas. We are a major energy importer rather than actually an energy producer. Um, I think we need to get actually much more energy secure in the way we do things because we're just vulnerable to basically just the fluctuating oil markets and gas markets of, of the world, which doesn't put us in a good position. Is not the only cause of what's going on. I do actually really back a lot of what Sarah has said on that it is Tory policies, um, but there is truth to that as well. It's our over-reliance on energy which actually fluctuates so much and I think we need to get a lot better at producing our own energy. I'd love to see some nuclear energy produced um, but generally green renewable energy I think is where we need to go. Brilliant. <coughs> Daniel. Well it's, it's fascinating listening to this uh, panel talk about economic policy and it's claimed that we haven't had enough Thatcherite policies in the last 13 years. The fact of the matter is what Thatcherite policies have we had as a government? If you want to look and why we've got inflation in this country. Inflation has come from the fact that we had a major splurging of public monetary in the form of lockdown, which caused uh, a huge amount of increase in money supply in this country. If you have an increased amount of money in the economy, the amount of money that you have in your pocket, which didn't increase because of lockdown, massively decreases. So it's <coughs> precisely because the government has spent far too much money that we've had inflation. And if we had a Labour government, you'd spend far more money and therefore inflation would get a lot worse. And it's also interesting listening to Owen on the importance of energy uh, in this country and the fact that we're apparently too reliant on oil and gas. So the last Prime Minister that actually got a nuclear power station built in this country was Margaret Thatcher, and that was 40 years ago. How extraordinary is that? Clearly in government, uh, we actually do need more uh, Thatcherite policies. But I do want to briefly talk about the budget that's coming up on Wednesday, uh, because you know, how was that going to respond to... Uh, the cost of living crisis. One of the most major policies that's going through is a raising in the corporation tax. The last time we actually had corporation tax increase in this country was 1974. Uh, and we're already seeing the effects of the fact that corporation tax is rising. AstraZeneca, uh, a science company that actually most people in this country quite lack, like for the fact that they didn't make a profit off their vaccines, has decided to build their new 230 million pound factory in Ireland, not the north of England, because taxes in this country, uh, as they said, are too discouraging for them to bother building a factory here. So if you want the economy to improve, if you want to have uh, an economy that's growing, don't vote Labour, because it's not going to provide it for you. Sarah, do you want to respond? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, there's quite, yeah, it's quite a lot to respond to. I firstly like to respond to Titus's point, <laughs> that the cost of living crisis has been in part been caused by the war in Ukraine. I would say that the cost of living crisis is not a new phenomenon, that people have been living in poverty in this country for a long, long time. And it is only now that we are seeing the effects of that, because suddenly it's actually conservative voters that are feeling the effects of it. It's been people have been living in poverty. Children have been living under the breadline for a long, long time. And you can't just call you can't just say it's the Ukraine crisis because it's not. Hmm. It's been it's been conservative policies over quite a, a, a long period of time that has caused this crisis. And I mean, for corporation tax, I mean, I, I would argue that it's best to have a corporation tax increase. But you can see at the moment that um, the Conservative Party is destroying itself over corporation tax. There's quite a few uh, backbench MPs uh, disagreeing with the current policy of the uh, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt. So, yeah, thank I mean, I mean, it doesn't need to rise, does it? I mean, the, the Conservative Party can't agree its own policy on that. Just to nail in more, <laughs> more um, just a couple of responses, Daniel. Firstly, of course, corporation tax has consistently fallen since '74 because it was like incredibly high in '74. You can't say that like, oh, we've never had an increase. It's just because we've started so high. Yes, we've continually gone down to the bottom. We are the lowest in the entirety of Europe, I think. So the idea that it's just uh, I don't um, think it's in a sense, I'm just all right. Saying I'll that. take that. Maybe maybe something. We are one of the lowest in Europe. Um, so the idea that it's entirely down to the way we've done our taxes, I think, is just completely ill-founded. Why is it Ireland, interestingly, over Britain? Is there anything there possibly related to the B word, related to Brexit? I'd love to hear your response to your your blessed Brexit in that one, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I'd, I'd love to Titus quickly gone. jump in on that. Yeah. Ireland is, in fact, the country with the, the lowest corporation tax in Europe, and theirs is 12.5%. And they, their, their country is, no is the home, well. the home of, <laughs> of Apple, of, of many international corporations have managed to attract a lot of outside investments, which has helped them become one of the wealthiest countries per capita in Europe. Uh, so I think looking at AstraZeneca's 
um, relocation, it, it does it does in fact speak to the the, the value of um, of having lower low corporation tax. And uh, and actually, when George Osborne did cut corporation tax to nineteen percent, we saw increased revenues from that from that tax. Uh, so I think the 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 fact that when you cut tax, it tends to increase revenues up to a certain point, uh, is that is something that is undisputable. Just, but could, can we talk about this this point of poverty? Because I'm very glad uh, that the panel has brought up uh, the issue of poverty, and it's just been kind of blamed on it's the Tories' fault. Can they actually give any specific examples of why it's the Tories' fault that poverty is so high? And why is it, do you think, that the inflation is so high? Is it not lockdown? Is it not the fact that the government spent so much money uh, that the value uh, has massively decreased? Give some specific examples, if you would. And how do you best combat poverty? Is it through a large estate, or is it through people actually creating wealth for themselves through businesses and an entrepreneurial spirit? I suggest it's the latter. If you want more of that, you're going to have to vote Conservative, not Labour. Indeed. Where's it been the last 30 years? Can, can, uh, I, can I just say to well, Daniel's point about well. poverty, um, Daniel asked me for an example about the Conservatives causing poverty, and I said oh. one at the very start of my speech, austerity. Hmm. Um, but how's it <laughs> I haven't been austerity for six years. I mean, I, but you can still feel the effects of austerity. I mean, if you're in a school, you can see there's less, there's, mm. there's more, there's more pupils per teacher. There's less teaching assistants helping students. Teachers are buying glue sticks, pencils, pens, just to try and help their students learn. I mean, you, you can see the effects of it in your day to day life. We are going to move to some questions from the audience now. Mm. Thank you very much. That was a, a lively opening um, discussion. Uh, we are filming this. If that puts you off, uh, then just let me know at the end uh, and we'll ensure that your bit is not going to be uploaded anywhere. Don't let that stop you from uh, asking a question. So do we have any questions from the audience on economic policy at all? <laughs> ben Duffy. Is capitalism evil? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we started with Sarah last time, so let, let's actually start with Daniel this time. Right, well I didn't expect uh, this, this incredibly broad question. Um, the answer to that is no. Look, we live, we live in a fallen world. Uh, we live in a world where people are not perfect. I suggest that capitalism is the best model to do that. And the answer for that is because it's based on service. If you're someone here that, that cares and wants to do well under capitalism, you have to serve others. If you want to create a business to make money, you're going to have to provide something that other people want. And if you create an economic system based on that, then I'm afraid that is the most uh, morally positive economic system out there. Contrast that to socialism <coughs> or indeed communism. If you want to do well and succeed under communism or socialism, it's about how much you can take from the government, how much you can take uh, from other people's taxpayer money, not how much you make for other people. And so therefore it is uh, the most morally positive economic system out there. Thank you to the Tories in the room for their claps. Um, Owen. Mm -hmm. I expect everything Daniel said will be turned on its head by Sarah, in that socialism is service, capitalism is take, 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 um, which I actually broadly agree with. I would disagree with the idea, though, that capitalism has to be immoral. Sorry, Sarah. But I, I do disagree with that. I think if it is, there is an immorality to it, because I think there is a immorality to every system. I think communism is immoral. I think anything really can be immoral. If it's twisted enough, if it's bent enough, I think it can be. That's just, I think that's just the way ideologies and systems work. They're corruptible. People do have self-interest. They do have things they can take from it. I think that's true. I think capitalism is good generally at creating wealth if it's controlled in the right way. So I think you can do things that People joke I look like Tony Blair here, and I really am looking forward to Tony Blair stuff. Um, but I, I do think you can have state steering of capitalism. So I disagree that free market is the best. I think free market, I've just let it go for it, is where the immorality comes in. I think that's the truth. But I think you can have it in a way which is still very productive, still beneficial, but has controls around it, parameters around it, which means that the poverty isn't too low, opportunities are still good, it's a better meritocracy or closer to one than you'd get in a free market system. So. <coughs> All Tony Blair's still in fashion. <laughs> <laughs> well, back in fashion, you might yeah. say. There was certainly a period where he was not in fashion. Um, I think if you, if you look at the last 40 years of world history and you look at the progress that's been made in combating absolute poverty around the world, uh, you've got to concede that we have made remarkable progress, that hundreds of millions of people have been taken out of poverty, out of absolute poverty. And the, the, the main place where that's happened has been China. 
Uh, and the, the reason for that has been the Chinese government has embraced uh, the free market system, or, or a, uh, like Owen said, a sort of um, directed market system, a market of controls. They, they've allowed enterprise in China. And what that has done is created prosperity that has meant that hundreds of millions of Chinese people have been lifted out of poverty. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems fairly moral to me. It seems that if you are enabling people to prosper, which, which is what the evidence tells us has happened in China, then that is something which is a force for good. Um, I'd also agree with Owen that um, when, you, when you don't have regulation, when you, when you let things um, just sort of run completely on their own, you, you will have abuses of, of that system. Um, and I also think that when you have too tight control, you will also have abuses by those in control, um, as you might see under a socialist system, for instance, in, in Russia, in the, in the USSR. Um, not, not Russia today, the, in the, the former USSR. Um, so I think that capitalism can be a force for, for good, but um, it does need to be um, regulated well. Mm, a third way. There you go. Right, Sarah, we saved you till last. Go on. Um, I think that I think the word evil is quite interesting that you, you use that word, but I w I'd like to caveat the speech with I'm Marxist. Um, so I, I think well, the round of applause for that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think capitalism is is a stage. It's a stage within the within Marxism. So you know, as Titus says, you know, people in China, for example, have been uh, lifted out of absolute poverty, and yet that is a facet of capitalism. And you know, you've you've got there to we acknowledge. Have it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to acknowledge that capitalism has lifted people out of absolute poverty. However, it has created extremes in inequality that have been unprecedented in in history um so evil i mean that's it's an interesting word um uh, it's, it's a stage within marxism it's a necessary stage but it's not a stage that is good um i would say and i think daniel's um analysis of um you know socialism communism as take 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 is quite interesting as mark said each according to their ability to each according to their need so it's, it's about what you can contribute to society it's how you can help others and it's about it's about being a, in a collective society. So I don't think it's all take take take. It's about being in a community together. But I would say to to if capitalism is evil, I do not support the exploitation of workers, and that's something that capitalism does inherently. So mm. in that way, yes, it is evil. Yeah. Do you want to have a response on this, well, this side? Of like, <laughs> yeah, of course. I think. I think you've got to listen uh, very carefully to what uh, Sarah said there about the morality of capitalism and the free market. What was her main point? I will say I've had many a discussion uh, with Sarah about this topic, so I think I know her views relatively well. She says inequality is wrong. She says inequality is wrong, and that's the key point on this. I don't think that's actually the case, and I disagree with that. And um, the person who best described this uh, was a hero of mine, a lady called Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> and, um, she, was, she was in the House of Commons and she had a question and she was asked by this Liberal Democrat MP Whoa. right towards the end of her... Uh, oh yeah, I'll let you know. Let me show some sports today. Right towards the end of her premiership and they said, you know, but inequality's risen during your time as Prime Minister. And she said this, she said, look, the poor are here and the rich are here. If you have state socialism, all right, the gap between the rich and poor will be less. It will be less. But guess what? The poor will be worse off. And if, if what you care about is the poor in this country, then you would want a more free market because, uh, because that is what the free market provides. It provides wealth for the poorest people in society. There's no evidence that socialism provides it. No evidence whatsoever. So stick with, stick with capitalism. Yes, you get inequality, and that's not particularly nice, but actually the poor are far better off, and that's what's far more important in this discussion. So, are there any countries that you would point to where socialism has assisted the poorest? I, I mean, as, Venezuela, as, perhaps. As, <laughs> as, as I'm a Marxist, I'm not a I'm not a Leninist. I'm not a Maoist. I'm a Marxist. I don't believe in um, in communism without the stages of capitalism and socialism before that. Therefore, you can't point to a, a country that has enacted oh. socialism in that way. <laughs> in that way and that's the kind of socialist that I am because I know you 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 often say Daniel in in the many discussions that I've had about this topic with you you don't say oh well there's no there's never been a true I say there's never been a true socialist or communist state 
that's fact. That's fact. There hasn't been a true socialist or communist state because we haven't, <laughs> we haven't been through the stages of capitalism yet to get to the socialist and communist state. <coughs> Well, there we are. Um, do we have a... Thank you very much. Um, do we have another question? One more for economics. Uh, let, we'll go with one from the right this time. Damien, go on. Yeah. 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 Two separate corporation tax proposed with a higher rate for businesses earning over £250,000 plus. So do the thresholds need rearranging rather than a blanket raise which would harm small businesses? Okay, uh, let's go to Owen first. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, love the specificness. Um, <laughs> the complete opposite. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say, like, yes, I think small businesses need to thrive better in the UK. I'd actually point to a lot of what Labour has at the moment. They've actually said they're going to cut um, small business, I can't remember the exact name, just business rates on smaller businesses. I think that needs to happen. Um, you just said this the last is question that you wanted to raise it. <laughs> no, I didn't. I genuinely did not. Um, I said that, like, yes, corporation tax, and some, we are still the lowest in Europe. I'm saying that specific policy is not necessarily what I back. That's a conservative government doing what they're doing. Like, do I think corporation tax on large corporations need to rise? Yes. Do I think small businesses need to be um, given a helping hand? Yes. I'm going to give a very, very quick analogy, which, like, just makes Sheffield sound awful. I was in Sheffield this weekend. I'm a Yorkshire lad myself. I love Yorkshire. But you walk around Sheffield... There is nothing in Sheffield. The high street, genuinely, in Sheffield is, is pretty much gone. I'm sorry if there's anyone in Sheffield here. I'm sure you generally agree with me, though, that like, I've walked around for the whole weekend. Most places there, so many have shut down because small businesses are struggling under tax, they're struggling with competition. And ultimately, it's small businesses that drive not only like the growth in this country, but also drive the character of a place, the community of a place, the sense of soul and identity that that area has. So that's why I think we, we do need to do a better job on them. So if I was a Conservative government, which I desperately hope will be gone in 18 months, but if I was then, yes, I would raise the threshold more. I don't, don't know the exact parameters, but yes, I think small businesses need to be given more support. Thank you. Titus. I'd largely agree. I think that we need to be doing more to support small businesses. They are important parts of our community as well as our economy. Um, I think when you have a, a business that's run by a local family, that's, that employs local youngsters, that... Um, that, that builds relationships, that helps to, to build community. Um, and I'm going to shamelessly plug the Prime Minister, but you look at the Sunak Pharmacy, I think that was a, that's a, a brilliant example of how small uh, locally run businesses can really, really bring something positive and then also provide a means of social mobility. Um, and so I, I do think that if there is a way to reduce the burden on small businesses, that should be, that should be looked at. But I'd also like to stress that um, fiscal responsibility is hugely important and ensuring that the government maintains um, a clear message of stability to business um, in this budget has to be um, the priority and I think that is what Jeremy Hunt is doing he is um, he's not giving away any any nice sugar sugar rush tax cuts um, like Simon Clark might be demanding um, and I think that is the right move in this uh, current environment um, so I think that on the, on the wider question of taxation, the government is being responsible and I would support their, um, their measures in this area. Brilliant. Sarah? Um, I, I would like to echo what Owen has said, that the, if the Labour Party were in power, they would cut business rates for small businesses. Um, and I would actually like to, this is something quite unusual for me, I'd like to quote the Labour Party, the current Whoa. Labour Party. <laughs> um, the, um, <laughs> the Labour Party, if they were in power, um, they would like to strength, strengthen the foundations for the economy, that's what they say, uh, buy, make and sell more. Mm. And I think that small businesses are important to that. They're important to the community and they're important to kind of high streets as well. So that's what, that's what the Labour Party would do if in power. Well, um, I can give an even better example uh, <laughs> than the fantastic example uh, that Titus gave, which is the treasurer uh, of, of the Conservatives here, um, an amazing lad called Joe Drinkwater. He's trying to set up a small business right now. And his passion for it, if you speak to him about it, is the fact that he believes his small business is going to help uh, thousands of small businesses across the country. That's his passion for it. And actually, guess what? He's finding the government to be uh, a real pain uh, to get that launched as he's currently a student doing it at the same time. So yes, small businesses matter. To briefly get back to what, to what um, the actual question was, Look, it's nice to, to treat small businesses uh, better than big businesses, and of course there are lots of tax breaks 
uh, for businesses that recently started up, but big businesses provide far more jobs. And if you're going to single them out, then you're going to get uh, what I mentioned earlier, which is AstraZeneca um, building its factory in Ireland and not the north of England. Brilliant. We're going to leave it there. Uh, Owen, I know you did mention the B word earlier, Brexit. I'm sure that will come up later on. Um, so we're going to move on to domestic. That's a very broad um, area of topics. Um, so do we have any questions on anything domestic, so anything party, political, anything run by the state? <coughs> James. Um, well, as I'm sure most of us know, the Tories are currently polling very poorly right now. Do you think that there is any possibility of them sort of recovering and potentially winning the next election? And if so, how do you see that happening? What mm -hmm. do the Tories need to do to fix themselves, fix their poll numbers and have an actual chance in the next election? Excellent question. Titus. Well, I think if you look at the, the polls in detail, uh, and actually first I'd like to say that we're still 18 months away and there is still a, a way to go until the next election. But, but if you look in the polls, uh, the polls in detail, you'll find that um, obviously the the, uh, the amount of people saying that they would vote for the Conservatives if there was an election tomorrow has, has fallen quite dramatically. But, crucially, those uh, voters have not started switching to Labour. There's a large chunk of uh, don't know voters. People which who often say, get excluded. In which, the... which often get excluded in the headline ones when it goes yeah. you know, straight up Labour versus Tory and it gives Labour at 50%. Titus, hold. can I just jump in? As you did for me, can I jump yeah, in? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to be too much of a politics nerd in this. It is my degree. I love polling. The amount that are switching from Tory to Labour is enough, basically. It's about 10 to 15%. That's the most you normally get in an election cycle. That's the sort of percentage switching that Tony Blair got. They are like, sure, it's not all, but 10 to 15% is actually pretty good. Most people don't change their opinion. 12% sure. is what is needed to get <coughs> Labour a majority of one, by the way. So you're bang in the middle of what you said. No, overall. <laughs> well, well, well um, the, the point still stands that there's a large chunk of, of don't know voters. And if the Conservatives can. Um, it, sure, they may be losing some votes to Labour, but if they can um, begin to deliver on some of their uh, the, uh, Rishi Sunak's five priorities, um, I think people will begin to uh, understand that they, the, the government is delivering on, on things that matter to them. And, and, and that is really what people want to see. They, we've, we've had a, you know, Boris Johnson who was, um, had many flaws, but was an effective communicator, um, but also was, was unable to pass anything much. And he, he couldn't get much done. And so what, pe what people are sick of is politicians talking about things and, uh, and not really doing anything. So if, if Rishi Sunak can um, yeah, begin to uh, make uh, progress on these, on these priorities, and I think he's already, he's already done that with the um, renegotiation of the Northern Ireland Protocol um, and the, the Windsor framework. Uh, but if he can continue that, uh, I think he'll, we'll, we'll start to see some of those don't knows come back to the Conservative column. And potentially he might even um, in, uh, get people who are, who are you know, unsure about voting generally to vote for the, vote for the Conservatives. Because there's, there's two, two places you can find votes. One is in the opposition column and another is in the people that don't normally vote. Uh, now that is obviously a, a, a difficult proposition after, um, in, after 2019 where lots of voters who often, often weren't um, that interested in politics or hadn't voted in the past did then vote and, and now potentially feel let down. But but there is a route there for, for Rishi Sunak if he if he can bring those don't knows in uh, and 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 stimulate um, some higher uh, a higher turnout among the Conservatives. Then he he can um, certainly um, yeah deny deny Labour a majority uh, if not even if he may not be able to to, to win one himself. Interesting, Sarah. Um, I mean, I know uh, probably anyone involved in Labour politics knows that you can't guarantee anything um, and, <laughs> and that you can't be too sure until the result is actually in, you can't say that there's been a victory. So I'm not going to say that the Labour Party are home and dry already, 18 months in advance. However, things aren't changing on the ground for people. Mm. Things aren't improving. When I go out and speak to people on the doorstep, things, they, they say, you know, their conditions aren't improving. Their prices are still astronomically high. They can't afford to heat their homes um, and, you know, and afford their food. So, I mean, the Conservative Party need a real turnaround in order to win the next general election. Um, they, uh, they, need to, they need some serious, uh, serious changes in their policies. I like to become on the don't knows as well. The Labour Party does need to do more to get those don't knows into the Labour Party column. And we need to introduce 
more comprehensive policies to improve people's lives. And I also would like to express support for trade unionists, and I think that's something that the Labour Party needs to do. Um, it's something that is integral to our history as the Labour Party, and we haven't really been doing that recently, and that, that would definitely transfer more people from the don't knows into the Labour Party column, I think. Daniel. It's a very good question. I wonder if you should perhaps reframe it and say how large do you think the Labour Party majority will be at the next election rather than uh, who's going to win it. Look, I think Titus is right uh, about the fact that actually if you look at the polls, yes, a lot of the people uh, who have left the Conservatives haven't quite switched to Labour yet, but we'll see uh, whether that kind of stays by the next election. I mean, there's a few interesting things at play here though. Firstly, we haven't actually had uh, a recession post lockdown. Everyone predicted it. You know, the CBI, all the top economic think tanks all said Britain's gone to a recession and dare I say it, despite Brexit, we haven't actually had <laughs> a recession in this country, which is quite an achievement, I think. But there's a bit of an adage um, with the Tories in general, that the Tories say the government's bad, uh, the government's not very good at doing its job, and then when they get elected, they only go and prove uh, that's the fact because they're so bad at actually governing the country. If Rishi Sunak can show that he is a good governor, you know, the last two weeks have been the best two weeks of his time as Prime Minister so far. You know, he got a deal in Northern Ireland, um, which everyone believes, whether it actually is a different question, but everyone actually believes has got Brexit completed. On immigration, immigration continues to be an open goal for the Tories. Um, maybe we'll have a question about immigration later, but basically most of the country don't really understand what Labour's plan is. Perhaps we can hear about that, but that is the case for most of the country. And he's obviously gone and got a deal uh, with that too last week, and you've got a budget coming up. Basically, if Rishi Sunak can keep on being competent, as he's seen to be the last couple of weeks, then yes, perhaps uh, Labour won't win by a huge landslide at the next election. Mm. But it's still a Labour victory, you think, Daniel? Well, Even it's, if it's not look, a huge one. It's not in the bag, but it, it's, it seems that way. It has been, you know, 13 long years, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with that. 13 long years, and I can't wait for them to come to an end. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question, James. And actually, what I liked about it was trying to put myself in the seat of Rishi Sunak of how would we actually, how, how would you win if you were the Conservative Party? Because um, Sarah's completely right. There's, it's not looking good for them. There is a lot against them. I mean, no government in history has ever got a fifth term in office. That's never happened in our entire history. Um, so that's going to be a challenge for them anyway, regardless of the fact that all the other things against them. I think there is a general anti-Tory swell of support. We've got like I think there's going to be a lot more tactical voting at this next election. I think most Lib Dems, Greens, hopefully, are now actually quite willing to see in certain areas that actually we do have to vote strategically. Same people in Labour. So I think that there was a lot of factors there that is going to be a struggle to them. Now, if they if they are to win, how would they do it? Um, this is not something I want to see them do, but I could. Im I think actually they were going to be really serious about trying to win. I think it's what they have to do. I actually think they have to go further right if they want to win. I actually think one of their biggest challenges is keeping their 2019 base together. I think, and this is not to broadly categorise that whole population, um, not population, but voting demographic, but I do think there's quite a few Tories who were very, very persuaded by the Brexit message. Without the Brexit message, and um, seeing a lot of things that they don't really like about Boris, fear the Conservatives aren't Conservative enough. I and mean, we've heard it a lot already. If you ever go to a Nuka event, like <laughs> all you hear is, oh, we hate the Conservative Party, they're terrible, they're not, they're not actually Tories. And I think actually that, that is a serious threat to them. Beyond simply losing people to don't knows, or beyond losing them to Labour, or just apathy and not voting, there's actually a real risk that Reform UK has a resurgence in different areas. And even if Reform UK starts polling 5-6% in certain constituencies, 5-6% is all it takes for Labour to win in some places. So if you get that base start going towards reform, actually they're going to be a lot worse off in trying to win. So for them, they've actually got to do more social issues, more, um, more things like stopping the boats, Red which me. is going to... What, sorry? Red meat. Red meat, yeah. All that sort of stuff that is actually going to keep the more con like socially conservative party on side and that part of that coalition. I would hate to see that happen to the governance of this country. I hope they don't do it. They are already doing it, but what I think is a pretty bad immigration policy. Um, but that, that, I think, is their only route to maybe just about winning it, is keeping what they had in 2019 and hoping Labour doesn't get high enough to beat them, if that makes sense.
Thank you. Do we have another question? Hannah. Yeah, my question's about strikes. Um, obviously, we've got the junior doctors going on strike this week. We've had serious amounts of strikes. Firstly, to all on the panel, do you believe that junior doctors and nurses deserve a pay rise? And secondly, if you could put a figure on what you think that would be in terms of you know, how big, and the impact that might have on inflation? Sarah, can I go to you? I mean, uh, thank you for your question, Hannah. I mean, I think you could probably all imagine that I definitely think that the junior doctors and nurses needed pay, stru uh, pay, pay increase. And I think that the UCU, RMT, CWU, SEU, NEU, all of these unions, they deserve a pay increase. And uh, the conditions that they work under is absolutely disgraceful. Just to hone in on the junior doctors and nurses. Uh, there's been a lot of kind of outrage and things like that at the junior doctors and nurses going on strike, which I think is quite interesting, really, because often they're seen as the most kind of beloved members of our society. These, you know, obviously these amazing people doing amazing things for everyone every day. And to see them going on strike, I think, has been quite a shock to people. Um, and especially, a bit, I'm thinking of the ambulance, stri uh, ambulance worker strike just before Christmas. Mm. There was a lot of outrage towards that. And a lot of people thinking, well, these people shouldn't be allowed to go on strike. But of course they should. They are, they are key pillars of, of our society. And without them, we wouldn't be able to operate in the way that we, in the way that we can. As, as are the strike, as you know, the fire brigade union, absolute key workers. And they, they've had you know, their, their ventilators stripped off their backs. They've had their conditions um, gone down the drain. So they definitely deserve a pay rise as well. These striking workers deserve a pay rise and they deserve our respect. Mm -hmm. To put a figure on it, I mean, I think, it's, I think it's a difficult thing to put on, but absolutely, at least well above inflation, uh, because at the moment these, people's, uh, these people have got a real terms pay cut, but I, think I, couldn't, I couldn't put a figure on it, to be honest, because I think it's, it's difficult to look at each individual circumstance, with the, particularly with the doctors and nurses, but absolutely these striking workers need a, a pay increase. Mm. Thank you, Sarah. Titus? Of course, the doctors and nurses do deserve um, pay increases and they um, yeah, they are hugely important uh, public sector workers. They are widely widely respected, and, and we should offer them a, a good pay deal that uh, recognises that. Um, and I, I think, yeah, you, you look at the the current um, inflation, and um, all people um, who work for the government should have pay increases to to help to help offset that. How much exactly? Um, I wouldn't want to give a figure on that. I don't know enough of the details about budgets and, and sort of levels of inflation. But um, I think I would be, be cautious about giving, giving a massive, uh, well, one that's massively over inflation, because what the risk is um, in that scenario is, is entering into a, an inflationary wage spiral, where wages increase to match inflation, which then causes inflation to increase, uh, and then wages increase again. We saw this in the 1970s, and it did a lot of damage to uh, everyone's ability to um, well, buy things that the, the everyone's spending power went um, uh, was diminished. So I think that we do need to be aware of that. We do need to be careful. Uh, but I, I do think that the doctors and nurses deserve um, a, a pay increase that is that is significant. Evan, mm. can I just sort of reheat my port and policy speech? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was a whole issue there. Um, yeah, really, really back to what it's like. And actually, just on that. Um, one of the key reasons I think we need to have this sort of NHS workers striking <laughs> is because actually 13 years of Tory rule hasn't taken care of them. And by that, I mean the pay, as Sarah said, in real terms has gone down in terms of what you can actually buy. What that's done is that it's just you have less incentive to actually work there. The conditions are terrible and your pay is much lower and you can buy much less with that pay for actually skills that you could do elsewhere. It's actually basic economics that I'm surprised the Tory party doesn't get which is that if you don't have an incentive really to stay there in comparison to different options, you won't work there. And the reality is we actually, I, think I don't even think it's about one in 10 jobs in the NHS is currently empty. Empty, genuinely one in 10. The NHS is running on 90% of staff, which is insane. When you think also on that, you've got people being off sick, people being off for stress. Like the NHS, the reason it's struggling so much amongst many reasons is because the pay has been cut so much that people don't want to stay and have left. So now the workforce has nothing left, really, and is forced to strike. Um, so yes, they need a pay cut so that we can actually just have a fully functioning working health system. Um, so yeah, I really agree with that. 
And I, interestingly, I want to see Daniel's response to this, because this is this whole premise of capitalism. They are the ones who are serving. That is their whole role. That's their whole job. If capitalism works, if it does truly work, we need to have them actually being paid well and have to serve, be paid for the service they do for society. Um, so, yeah, really back it. I love the question of can you give a specific figure trying to trap us there. <laughs> I, would, um, I would actually agree with what Titus says, though. I, I do think we, there's, we do have to be wise about the exact figure. I think what the government's been offering is too low, um, but I, if it should be way above inflation, I would question that. I think it does need to be kind of a, a good enough um, increase that you can still live off it. I think we need to see continuing increase per year that is a healthy increase. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say the way to deal with that is one big splurge pay increase. I think it's more of a gradual thing. Daniel then. Right, yeah, this is, this is probably the hardest question uh, I've been asked tonight, which is bad for me, probably uh, good for you guys and democracy in general. Um, <laughs> I would say, um, you know, be careful uh, listening to people like Sarah because she will basically, <laughs> she will basically um, support a strike no matter what. I mean, they could ask for a pay increase of 100% and she'd still um, support it. But it's hard to criticise the junior doctors because as has been noted, they are some of the most lovable people in the country. What they have been demanding, though, is a 35% increase. I have looked it up. I don't think anyone else on the panel has had the good fortune to do that. And if that was to be paid out by the government, you know, that would be 1.3% uh, of the NHS's total uh, figure. If you think that's an amazing fact for me to pluck out, yeah, no, I looked it up. Um, <laughs> so, no, I, no I, I think the government should reject it uh, if it is that high. Um, but... Look, it's a flipping tough situation, and th that is my answer to that question. Thank you, thank you. Okay, another question, Ben? Yep, so the last question for me, because I promise this is domestic. So in the 2019 European uh, election for the European Parliament, um, the Brexit party came first, and the Liberal Democrats came first. <laughs> 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 continuing this point, uh, Def Deputy Chair Lee Anderson is currently at risk of being unseated by the Ashfield Independents, who during the last election sort of came second with 27.6% of the vote, and Lee Anderson got under 4% himself. And so sort of what I want to meander this question into is, will we ever see a transition away from the current two-party politic system? Ooh, that's, ooh, I like that question. Um, <laughs> so does our audience. Thank you. Um, okay, let's go to... Daniel, can we start with you, please? Yeah, I'm very glad you brought up uh, Lee Anderson. What a legend, I have to say. <laughs> his, um, his, tweet, his, uh, his tweet where he said he supports the death penalty uh, because no one is, it has a 100% success rate, no one's committed a crime uh, since dying was, was quite something to behold. For your, for your more um, general question on whether we're ever going to see the end of the two-party state, look, it's been predicted on so many occasions. The only way it's going to end is if you get rid of first past the post. Uh, but I'm a supporter of first past the post. I hope it stays. It is the better way to do democracy in this country. It's how we've done it for centuries. Um, so no, I'll give a short answer. Um, no, we've got no. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I basically agree with Daniel. Um, I think yeah, you're going to you're going to struggle on the first past the post. I think we have to move to a PR system. Um, <laughs> Which I I can see. Mr. Duff is a big fan. Yeah, I, I, I weighed up when for a while that like the um, Lib Dem and Labour might have to do a pact. I was like, will it work? Will it not work? I don't think I don't think PR is actually a good system. I don't think it's going to actually work. There are ways you can make first past the post better. I think single transferable vote, the lovely SU system, is actually a decent system. Um, I think that's pretty good. That's probably the best way you can get for democracy. It's quite good at building consensus. If anyone doesn't know it, you basically put a first and second preference. Um, it incentivizes you not just to stick with your base, because if you're a politician, you have to get 50% of the vote plus one. So you have to get a majority to win. So you can't just do very factional politics where you stand on just your base and you know you're the best. Not the best, but you know you'll win because you've got 35% and Labour's only got 33 but you actually have to go out and really try and build up consensus and support, which I think is a good thing for our politics. So I would disagree with Daniel on that, but that's throwing it in there just to disagree with Daniel. <laughs> um. Well, I'd, I'd also um, answer to your question, uh, no, I don't think that's 
something we'll see on the first past the post. Um, and I would actually like to um, yeah, address the question of proportional representation because I think it would be a, a markedly inferior way of running our politics. We saw in an election under the coalition that it was roundly rejected by the British people mm. um, and it was not supported. So there, there's clearly no support for changing it. Uh, and I think what first past the post gives you when you have a, a, a representative democracy is that you have local representatives who are accountable to the local people, who are accessible to their constituents. Uh, I was on the Mansfield Road today, I walked past Nadia Whittam's office, constituency office. You have local people that represent the area. I can go in there with my concerns and she can represent me in Parliament. People, people may say that proportional representation is, is more representative, um, but it really, it really depends what you mean by that? So what, what is it more representative of? It might represent the sort of headline views of the of the country as a whole, but it doesn't represent the individual as well. It doesn't it doesn't have the local accountability that first past the post has, and that is that is the real strength of having local constituencies and um, and elected representatives that are tied to them and not just shoved off a party list system where there's very little accountability apart from within the party. Sarah. Um, well, thank you for your question, and I, I, we can see the impact of smaller parties over the last kind of 13 years or so, kind of the Lib Dems coalition, the DUP later, um, UKIP, <laughs> UKIP in... Change UK? No, no. Change UK? You never saw after a disapproval. Um, I was pretty good actually. <laughs> but but I, would, I would like to agree with Owen, with STV, to be honest, and I think that uh, Titus makes a brilliant point about a uh, constituency MP, but you have, you can have that with STV because they need to, they just need to get 50% of the vote. That's what you can have. You can have that kind of system. You just need to, you need, just need to put down a first and second preference. So I think that that kind of system would work. Um, but under first past the post, I think that there is limited scope for a, th a third major party at least. Um, but yeah, I, w I would, I would favour go to STV as a voting system. I'd also, on, I'd, I'd also like to make the, the quick point that I, I find it bizarre that, that Labour Party members uh, like um, some in the audience or, or many at the, the conference would uh, support proportional representation so passionately when it would significantly damage Labour's electoral prospects. Um, if you want to attain power, if you want to get anything done, then uh, do not vote for proportional representation. But it seems that Labour members have not, have not really grasped this. Uh, can I, to can that, I to that. Yeah, go on briefly, Sarah. Um, I mean, I would like to say that politics isn't just about getting things done, it's about principles as well. <laughs> um, and I think, I think that um, giving people more options about who they can vote for and more uh, kind of accountability and, and relationship with their local representative, I think that that's fantastic. And although that, that may negatively affect the Labour Party, <laughs> I would say it's better for democracy. I, I think if you look at the options, Gone. sorry, <laughs> we will draw this to a close, um, but in terms of the options to vote for, there, there is a place where there's a debate about um, what, what type of Conservatives ought to be standing, what type of um, Labour representative ought to be standing, and that happens before candidates are selected, that happens within the party. If you want to uh, have a say about which direction the parties go, about where these broad sort of coalitions of um, voters and, and um, uh, yeah, activists, there's expressions of uh, different styles of politics, in which way they go. If you want to have a, a say in that, then, then you should join a party. You should join a party, you should get involved, you should um, express what you think at your association or um, at your local party's meetings. And, and that is the way our system works. That is how we have a wide uh, representation of views. That is where it gets expressed. And then you come to the country, for people who are slightly less interested in that, and you give them an option. And then what they vote for, they get. Unproportional representation, you have a system where people will vote for a party uh, under on, on, on a manifesto and that party will potentially join a, go a coalition government and then have to drop two thirds of their manifesto. Coming and so you vote something and you, you only get a small chunk of it. Um, whereas in, in uh, first past the post, you have um, yeah, a system where the, the party that wins gets to implement their manifesto. <coughs> Can I make it a very, 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 brief very briefly. <laughs> do, do join your political party. Obviously, if it is the Conservatives, mm -hmm. even more reason to join it. Um, <laughs> but here's, here's a fact for you. When I was um, elected president of uh, the Conservative Association here, there were about 10 people at the AGM, right? 
a lot of MPs in Parliament had less people at their local associations vote for them, which means I actually had a larger amount of people support me <laughs> to become president than a lot of MPs did to choose them as candidates. Um, so if, if you do join a political party, you actually find you have a lot of power because so few people bother to join their, their political party. Well, Danny, well, you have slightly undermined my point there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, talking about like broad uh, parties, I'm just going to chuck, chuck one in there. Uh, a certain someone has n not been allowed to stand for Labour, Jeremy Corbyn. What do you think to that decision, Owen? Oh, straight to me. <laughs> um, yeah, really back it. Sorry, Sarah. Um, <laughs> Yes, I, I do back that. I think. I mean, I don't. I think at the end of the day, he's probably still going to win in his constituency. Mm. I don't know if we could actually ever uproot Jeremy Corbyn from that area because to be fair to him, he's been a very good constituency MP. And he's been there forever. He will know him. Um, do I think he should stay as a Labour MP? No. I think politically for Keir, he has to get rid of him. I think he. He can't go to the next election with the potential to be attacked by these guys over there saying you still have Jeremy Corbyn in your party, Jeremy Corbyn still has control over you. Because the reality is, people, you actually look at what happened in 2019, there were many different factors, but one really big one that came up on the doorstep was Corbyn. It was him. He's a polarising figure that a lot of people see as thoroughly incompetent and really dislike. If we keep him in the party, we're vulnerable to attack. We have to be ruthless. I actually, sorry, Sarah, I really disagree with the idea that politics is about principle. Politics is about changing people's lives. That is the truth of politics. Thank you. That is about, well, I've got one I half clap. <laughs> I'm sorry to be the, the ruthless. <laughs> um, I, I do think that's what politics is about. It's about actually improving the lives of people. Principles are good. Principles should guide us, but we can't always have purity in them. The world is messy. We have to to be ruthless sometimes, and I think with Corbyn we've got to be ruthless. Sorry, sir. Titus. I do believe that political parties should be uh, big tents. I believe that they should encompass a wide range of views. I, I generally think that um, you should include people that you disagree with uh, within your parties and you shouldn't be rushing to kick out previous leaders. However, I think with the case of Jeremy Corbyn uh, and the anti-Semitism which he allowed to fester and grow within the Labour Party and the fact that he did almost nothing about it. He, he didn't um, attempt to combat it in any meaningful way. That is quite a si significant charge against him. And I think if Keir Starmer wants to be, uh, show that he's serious about combating anti-Semitism, um, which is the right thing to do, then he needs to um, hold Jeremy Corbyn, who was responsible for, um, for, for, for the lack of action and for it, allowing it to grow, he needs to hold him accountable. He needs to um, take serious action. And that's what he's done. Um, so I, I do believe in the principle of, of big tent parties where people you disagree with are included, but I think that Corbyn um, was, had other, other um, yeah, failings which he, he needed to be um, held accountable for. Sarah. Um, it's not a surprise, but it's extremely disappointing. That's what I'd say about um, Jeremy Corbyn not being able to, to stand for the Labour Party. And I'd like to pick up on Titus's point about um, po political parties being a broad church. And I think that that is one of the most amazing things about the Labour Party is that Owen and I can be in the same party. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we disagree on quite a lot, and yet we can agree on some of the most fundamental things um, and about changing people's lives. And that's one of the things I love about the Labour Party. And at the moment, you can see that that is not happening in the Labour Party. I'd just like to use the example of Brockstow um, at the moment. And um, uh, uh, Greg Marshall um, has, been, has been stopped from standing in, in um, Brockstow uh, as, as the Labour Party candidate. Um, Greg Marshall is a, he's a local candidate. He's um, extremely well connected with the uh, Brockstow CLP constituency Labour Party. And yet he's been blocked from standing. Um, the the local Labour Party, the executive has resigned, um, and I, I mean I think that this is an extremely significant move. Brockstow will probably be won by the Labour Party in the next general election, and uh, it's clear that the um, Labour Party do not want a left winger there. Um, and I think that, that that's that's something that really needs to be looked at within the Labour Party and the cutting out of left wing people within the Labour Party. The Labour Party is brilliant. I absolutely love it with all my heart, but it needs to stop cutting out the left. And it, yeah, there we are. Thank you. Um, and the candidate you mentioned there, well, not the candidate, is was backed by Momentum, isn't it? Yes. And stood in 2017 and 2019. Daniel. 
Um, well, it's interesting listening to her. I probably won't get the same round of applause that she did. <laughs> We've got the same problem in the Conservative Party. Uh, it, you know, we had John Hayes, our honorary president, uh, the MP for uh, South Holland, the Deeping, since 1997. You know, he estimates only only a minority of the Conservative Party are actually Conservative. Most of them are basically um, closet uh, Liberal Democrats. So there, there is too much control by the uh, the central party in candidate selection. It was an own, it was basically an open goal for, for Keir Starmer, though. Basically, Jeremy Corbyn did not accept the anti-Semitism report. He never wanted Corbyn in the party anyway. He's doing a very good job at modernising the party. So I kicked him out. I mean, it's as simple as that. Why didn't he accept the anti-Semitism report? And by the way, if you're wondering, that's also why you should vote to disaffiliate from the NUS. Right, we're going to move on now to foreign policy or foreign, foreign affairs questions. Do we have any questions? Sean? Yeah, so 33% of people crossing the channel are from Albania. I lived in Albania for three years and my father worked in the foreign office there. There is not war or famine in Albania. There are economic push factors such as a lack of good jobs. However, given Britain is relatively rich compared to most of the world, how many economic migrants can we take in before our system becomes too strained? Okay, let's go to you, Titus. <laughs> well, I think, I think that is the reality with uh, many of these, uh, these people coming over in the small boats, is that there are, there are a significant proportion of them are economic migrants. And often the debate about this gets, uh, you'll have, have one side talking about being welcoming to refugees, and the other side talking about securing borders uh, and economic migrants. And I think when you look at the, the government and, and its record, and, and people like to target Scarlett Braverman and talk about how she's all xenophobic, and, but actually they have issued hundreds of thousands of visas to people fleeing war from Ukraine, to people fleeing um, authoritarian regimes in China, or, or Hong Kong specifically, and in Afghanistan. There have been, uh, there's been significant help uh, has been offered, and um, yeah, like I said, hundreds of thousands of um, refugees from these regions have been accepted. If you, act, if you look at the, cha the channel, you have a system uh, or a situation where there's a significant portion of economic migrants who are being, um, where criminal gangs are, are taking advantage of these people um, and, and bringing them to Britain. And, and there are people who are in, in appalling conditions in the channel, so it's very dangerous, people have died. And this is something that has got to stop. The government needs to ensure that these small boat crossings stop. And whether this bill that they've proposed is going to do that, I'm, I'm not certain. I, I'm, I do have concerns about the, um, the modern slavery, preventing them from accessing the modern slavery system. I think that um, is potentially going to leave a lot of people who have been trafficked out of the cold. But I do think it's a serious problem that the government needs to get a grip of and that people who are genuine refugees should um, come through the safe and legal routes that are available um, and, and should not be jumping the queue. Um, actually, go to Sarah. Sorry, Aaron Shaw. Um, well, thank you very much for your question. I'd like to touch upon the um, immigration bill um, that has been re recently proposed by the Conservative Party and the disgraceful language and content of the bill itself. Um, um, so I, I find it extremely interesting that Suella Braverman was uh, unable to confirm whether this bill is compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. Hmm. Isn't that a disgrace? Isn't hmm. that absolutely disgraceful yeah. that our Home Secretary was unable to confirm whether an immigration bill is compatible with human rights? What, like, this con Conservative Party needs to, needs to go. It's, a, it's an yeah. absolute disgrace. I think also which is, which is significant is that to, to apply for asylum in the UK, you actually have to be in the UK. So how are these people supposed to get into the UK without applying, like, they, they, need, to, they need to be able to apply to, to uh, they need to be in the UK to apply for asylum. So how are they supposed to get there? I mean, um, that's a question for uh, the Home Secretary. For your point about economic migrants, I'd like to touch upon that in particular. Um, I. I I mean, as you can imagine, I'm, I'm quite pro-immigration. I think that it's absolutely fantastic and that institutions such as the NHS have been extremely supported by economic migrants. But I, I always think that 
Personally, I'm extremely lucky to be in this situation I am, and that it's that it's a lottery essentially, and that I I've done well. So who am I to stop someone from coming here and getting the benefits that I have from just being lucky? Essentially, I was I was lucky to be born in this country. Um, so that that's what I think that that we shouldn't be stopping economic migrants because ultimately it was a lottery to where they were born. So I'm it's who am I to stop them from coming? And I think that they contribute hugely to society. Thank you, Sarah. Um, you mentioned that the Human Rights European um, Court of Human Rights. There are only two countries, for the, for the audience's um, knowledge, that aren't uh, signed up to that, and that is Russia and Belarus. Um, so if we were to withdraw, we would be in a club of three. Uh, Daniel. Well, I, I, I wonder if the panel actually knows some of the key stats uh, on immigration. Last year, uh, a total of 1.1 million people moved to the United Kingdom. Um, the question was actually about economic migration, which is of course what almost all migration from Albania is. It is a safe country. 2% of all adult males aged between 20 and 40 have now moved from Albania to the United Kingdom. That is crazy. And if you want to talk about the economic statistics in the United Kingdom, do you know the number of people in this country who are working age and unemployed? It's five million people. What economic benefit does it have to the United Kingdom to bring in, uh, and it is almost entirely men who actually cross the channel in small boats, to this country? Yes, there are places like the NHS, and Owen did mention this earlier, which are understaffed and underfunded. If you had an immigration policy like the Australian point style system where you could say, yes, we haven't got enough doctors, of course we need more doctors in this country. How about, by the way, improving the way we actually train our doctors and get more doctors trained? But anyway, we'll just import them in because that's the better way to do it, apparently. Um, no, it makes no economic sense to do it. There's been a 500% increase in the amount of people smossing, uh, crossing the channel. It is a course run by criminal gangs. Uh, it is only the richest people of the poorest countries who actually make their way to the United Kingdom uh, through this method. And it is of no benefit to us. And, and to the point that Sarah said earlier of the fact that I happen to be in the United Kingdom and therefore who should I be to say that these people shouldn't come? Well, guess what? There's something called integration. There's something called culture. And if you get people coming over to this country in too high numbers without saying, no, these are British values that we actually subscribe to, then you're going to have a culture clash. And it's no wonder that this is an issue that Labour has consistently lost on for decades, because most of this country is actually socially conservative, recognises there's something called British culture, and recognises that you have immigration in too high numbers, not no immigration, but if you have immigration in too high numbers, you're going to get clashes. Interesting with the uh, Australian points-based immigration system that did result in higher levels of immigration um, than before. Owen? All I'm going to say is I'm, there's a question that we, that someone over there wants to ask a question that that side is ready to beat up Daniel. I want to see a question from those guys. <laughs> um, but Mike, can I, can I just, I'll finish mine first. Yeah. Um, I've actually spent most of this thing thinking, what am I actually going to say to this? Because immigration is something that I haven't had much of a form view on. But luckily, Felix told me to do some prep into the economy, and I read some actual stats in the economy today, and all I can say is, Daniel's wrong. Um, Daniel's stats are actually quite wrong. In the UK, thank you. Um, you in, the UK, in, in the UK economy at the moment, we don't have a surplus of people to jobs. For the, one of the first times in our entire history, we actually have a surplus of jobs to people. There is actually more jobs available in this country at the moment than there are people looking for jobs. That is a fact. That genuinely is an actual... The BBC said it... No, sorry, Titus. Uh, <laughs> I, I am out of you to I am out of you before. Okay, get, let, me, let, me, let me get back in a second. Um, so basically, our economy at the moment, and this is a long-standing thing, look at our birth rates. Our birth rates have been declining for a long time. We have an ageing population. That is an economic fact we have. We have an ageing population which means that we have less people working, more people demanding more money in pensions and in um, like NHS fees and things like that, and in care fees. So the reality of our situation is we actually need more labourers. That is the reality, we need more people actually working. Our economy at the moment needs more people in it working. Um, what does that actually look like in reality? That's the really tricky question because you raised a great point that 
I don't think we can allow unlimited immigration. This is the genuine tricky thing we have of where do we stop and what do we do once we've stopped it? Because people are always going to come. And that is a genuine massive difficulty of immigration is saying, yes, we want people, but we don't want literally anyone and everyone who's going to come. We have to put some sort of limit on how many we can take. And I'll be honest, I actually don't have an answer for what you do well in that situation. Um, I actually really don't know. It's a really, really complex, tricky issue that is always going to come if you say that you have a border. It's the reality of borders and the reality of limited immigration that you're going to face that issue. I actually don't know a perfect system to deal with it. Um, but what I would say is that we can't think that economic migrants, that ones that outside of skilled ones, general economic migrants, it is just an economic fact in our country with our population until our birth rates go back up, which will take a lot of government intervention. Actually, we do need more laborers. We do need economic migrants just so our state system runs. So we have enough actual tax funds in our system to work. So that's why I challenge a lot of what Daniel said. I just briefly respond, then we'll take one very brief last question. I was just going to quickly address the point you made about the surplus of jobs in comparison to workers in the British economy. That is a phenomenon that we have seen in the aftermath of the pandemic and uh, lockdowns, where you have un uh, unprecedented levels of workers who are long term, um, long term sick or um, off work for um, to, to be caring for people, to be looking after people, and. It's, a, it's an unusual situation. And this is something that Jeremy Hunt has talked about and he's talked about addressing, about how we can encourage people mm. to come back to work um, when they maybe have a, um, a long-term illness. And, but how can you get them to work? Uh, in, uh, get them to work sounds rather harsh, but it, it encourage them to um, also be able to participate in the labor market. Not every job requires um, you know, hauling great big loads. There are lots of, lots of jobs that people can do even when they um, have certain um, disabilities or, or ailments and that um, can be quite empowering when you have someone who is is contributing towards something something bigger contributing towards something positive uh, and so there's there that is that is a problem that really needs addressing rather than just bring in loads of extra people but how can we uh, re-engage people who maybe have been had long long covid or um, been affected by uh, things to do with the pandemic and the lockdowns yeah. Thank you. We're going to take one brief question to wrap up. We'll take one from over here. Um, Mark, go on. Yeah, so um, a few things. I don't know whether the question is completely. Um, I mean, first of all, Daniel, you mentioned the statistic about 1.1 million migrating to the UK. What you didn't mention was that in the ONS press release for where that uh, data was put from, it also mentioned that 560,000 people left the UK, therefore the net migration being almost half of what you said. Also, I don't care about net immigration. Also, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> All right, well, go Daniel first. Please yeah, um, a few, quick, this one. Yeah, if you, I was directly questioned there. Firstly, I don't really care about net immigration. I think the most important fact is the amount of people that do come into the country. And that's because, yes, economics does matter with immigration. It does, of course it does. The far more important thing is culture and whether you are actually getting integration into the country with the people that are coming in. That's far more important um, than economics. Secondly, if you do think we have an ageing population, why don't you incentivise having children? Why don't you further incentivise having children? Countries do it all the time. If that's your key problem, then do that, rather than you know, getting doctors trained in India and basically stealing them and bringing them to the UK. That doesn't strike me as a particularly moral way of doing our policies. But on the point with Labour, they may be doing better at it. I, I don't particularly know. But essentially, the country thinks you don't have a plan. The Tories have a plan. 
they say we're going to stop the boats no matter what, even going to break the ECHR, which doesn't look particularly good. But to be honest, the ECHR is more messy than you probably think. And you should talk to Callum about that if you, if you want to get a lawyer's perspective on it. But Labour's plan, you know, the best I've heard is we're going to cut down on the criminal gangs. Well, how? How are you going to do that? What do you actually think about migration? What do you think of it morally? If you listen to Rishi Sunak on any interview he's done on migration, he's been clear. He says illegal immigration is unfair. He's big on the morality aspect of it because he says people come to this country legally, it's unfair that people just get in through the back door compared to the people who try really hard to get in legally and that isn't fair. Whereas Labour, they've got, they've got nothing on that. So it is still a winning point for the Tories, I'm afraid. Thank you. Thank you. I keep thinking the giraffe for hand up. Okay. <laughs> um, as Titus Foods has asked us to be really quick, um, I think Labour are leading on that because Keir Starmer uses competence People trust him generally more than Rishi Sunak. I've shown that in loads of different polls. People think he's going to be the better Prime Minister than Rishi. I think it flows from that. I'm, I mean, I'd love it if Sarah's got ideas on immigration policy for Labour. It's probably the area, I'm, I'm honest, I'm least interested in of Labour. So I actually couldn't give you a great explanation of it. Um, I think it's that. I wish you'd ask questions about culture. That whole row, you were shaking your heads when Dan was talking about culture. That's what I was dying for you to beat him up on. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, there, there, you go. There, can, there can be time after. Well, Gary Lineker did, didn't he? <laughs> um, um, yes, uh, thank you, Owen. Uh, yeah, Labour are leading the polls on immigration. The recent announcement by the government, which I think the vote's on tonight on the illegal immigration bill, has seen the Conservatives' um, support for the Conservatives on immigration increase, but Labour still do have um, a lead there. Titus? Again, I'm not um, aware of all the, the data behind uh, Labour's potential lead in the area of migration, but I do think uh, they lack a clear plan, they lack a clear vision for, for how it's going to fit in. I imagine part of it is that people don't trust the Conservatives anymore when they say talk about bringing down migration. They've talked about it for the last 13 years and it hasn't really happened. And actually we've seen in the last four years these small boat crossings have increased almost exponentially. Um, and so it may potentially be down to a lack of trust in the current authorities and the willingness to try other options when it comes to it. Um, I do think though there is a significant cohort of Labour voters, um, potentially also Lib Dem voters, who uh, think that uh, attempting to crack down on this kind of illegal um, movement is is horrifying and the, the Gary Linekers of the world um, are very happy to um, make, a, make a big fuss about it on social media, c compare the government to the Nazis, uh, which I think is completely inappropriate and um, actually quite insensitive to uh, th those who were killed and brutalised by the um, Nazis. So I think that Labour is looking to balance between um, coming down uh, as, um, coming up with an effective uh, plan to deal with this problem and appeal to their working class, uh, maybe so slightly more socially conservative voters, but also to um, keep the Gary Linekers of the world on board um, and those who are very uh, passionate about um, uh, this issue and, and, and mostly concerned with the, the compassion element. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sarah, to finish us off. Um, uh, regrettably, I think that the Labour lead in um, immigration is nothing to do with the Labour Party, it's just to do with the disgraceful policies of the Conservative Party and the rhetoric that the Conservative Party have been peddling for the last 13 years, demonising immigrants. Um, that's my quick answer to that question. I'd like to respond to a few of the things the panel have said. Um, firstly, about um, British culture, I'd just like to quickly say to Daniel that multiculturalism is the, one of the most fantastic things that is part of Britain, to be honest. But it's... Mm. Um, I'd also like to comment about the small boats um, and that, um, that Rishi Sunak thinks that this is unfair. Well, to be honest, not many, I, I, I wouldn't know anyone that would want to get in these boats. These are people that are risking their lives to cross yeah. the channel. It's a dangerous crossing um, and people don't do it lightly. Anyway, uh, by saying it's unfair, I think that you're undermining the gravitas of this decision and the importance of, of, um, of these people, this, this decision for these people. Also for the Gary Lineker um, thing, I'd like to just comment on that briefly. Um, Titus said that you know Gary Lynn compared um, these actions to Nazi Germany. He didn't. He compared the language to, to 1930s Germany. I don't support 
um, I don't support right. um, comparisons with um, Nazi so Germany. So Ella Bradman hasn't called for, for a race war. So no, it's I, I think it's, it's quite, no, no, quite no, a different proposition. Can I, can I, I quote Sue so Ella Can I let, quote let, Daniel? Let, Daniel sorry, totally we're not going to wrap up scenes. I, I think it's just important to establish the facts and the fact that Gary Lineker didn't compare these policies to Nazi Germany. He just said that the language and the rhetoric is similar to that of 1930s Germany. I do not support comparisons with Nazi Germany because it undermines the true horrors of Nazi Germany, but I think that it's important to look at the facts. Well, language is similar to, you know, it's similar and there were words there, you know, they both, they both spoke, <laughs> but I don't think there's any real similarity between the type of um, uh, policy or, or even rhetoric that the Nazis um, had and, and the, the, the government of today has been um, putting out. Right, we're going to wrap up there. Thank you, everyone. Sorry if everyone uh, slightly there. Thank you to Sarah Owen, Titus and Dan for coming on. Thank you to all of you for coming to watch and giving your questions. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you to Jacob for filming. And I know I sprung that on you as you came in here. So thank you very much. Thank you. That's, that's that then. Thank you. Right, we're going to go. Are you standing? I think both. All right.